John 17, 3, like you correctly acknowledge that the only true God is a father. So Jesus said now that the only true God is a father and he, and he is a Christ. And the Christ who has sent him. Sorry, the, the, he is the Christ who was sent by the father. You see, what was the prayer? You started from John 17, 1, which is good. Actually, I like the way you put things in context because in John 17, 1 and 3 and, uh, sorry, 1, 2 and 3, in that he said, God give me the glory yes what is he praying now he's saying no this is John uh, sorry John 70, uh, 75 where he says give me the glory that I had with you first and foremost if Jesus was Almighty God did he lose his glory right let's go back to the original question before he just did five minutes spill the question was this I stayed in John's gospel you were the one who jumped out of Matthew, to Matthew's gospel and then you accused me of changing the subject and the context so did you change it or did I change carry on carry on who stick to John's in three. Stick to John 7 in three. If you can't answer, then I'll answer who for you. It? Okay, so basically he doesn't want to answer the who question, which is the you glory. You see, when, when you talk about a God who is actually praying for glory, that means he's a glory less God. Yes? So whether it's Bob the Builder or this guy here, it doesn't matter. When a God prays for glory, the most essential part of his essence, that means you're not talking about God Almighty. You're talking about someone who was glory less and he's asking his only true God. Who was his only true God? The Father. So he's asking the Father to grant him the glory. Now why is Jesus asking for glory? Number one, even if he was, let's say for the sake of argument, was with the Father, according to John 1, 1, okay? Then the question is this, he is now reincarnated as a man. Not reincarnated when he's, at all. Okay, incarnated as a man, and this incarnation of his, what happened during the incarnation? He lost his most essential he, property. He didn't lose anything. Well, why is, he, why is he begging God for glory? He's not begging God. Is he praying to God he's for glory or not? God. Did he not pray he's for glory? begging? Praying is begging, yes. In this context. Yes. Are you saying yes, Jesus yes. To me, him? praying to someone, it is because you yourself cannot fulfill it. So that's the reason you have to beg someone else to fulfill that for you. Whether it is God or whether it's someone else, in this case, it's clear that your God, who is Jesus, is without glory and he's asking. Let's say, use the word asking or praying, like you said correctly. He's praying for what? Glory, which is the essential property of God Almighty. If he is without his glory, then that is not God Almighty. Not it is glory. a false God. Carry on. Never, he was never without his divinity or his glory, but they were concealed. They were hidden. From whom? From, from, the, from the... You could not look upon Jesus and see a halo around him or a glory around him. You just saw an ordinary human being. So did Jesus have glory? Yes, he did. So and why is he glory, praying? That glory was... We, we got a glimpse of it on the Mount of Transfiguration. So why is he asking when, God for glory? He, no, in the, 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 he's clearly... Wait a minute. He's clearly asking for glory. There's no doubt about it. In John 75 give me the glory that I had with you yes and this man is lying he's clearly lying this is a disingenuous preacher here just like many Christians who come in when the Trinity is in question they do not want to even take the words of Jesus as being authoritative he wants to twist like the Pharisees he wants to twist the words of Jesus Jesus clearly says Jesus is praying and he says give me the glory that I have with you how is that not asking for glory before the foundation of the world so do you believe jesus existed before the foundation just answer the question asked you do you believe jesus existed answer before the, the question asked you the answer the question asked you did he ask for glory or not jesus when he came incarnate had his glory hidden from human beings and he asked for that glory to be revealed again when he went back to heaven so wait a minute jesus is asking for which glory the glory he had before the foundation of the world where all creation worshipped Which is a divine glory, right? A divine glory. He never lost the glory. So why is he asking for it if he didn't lose it? Does it make sense? <laughs> because as a man, he was limited to a human body. You could not see that glory or anything else about so it. So Jesus himself did not know that he had glory. Because he had, knew he had glory. Then Jesus, why is he asking? He's asking that it might be revealed again. Well, he kind of grabbed it for himself. <laughs> wait, wait, look at this, look at this. Did you see what he, what he did there? He said, so it can be revealed again. That means it was hidden from him either way. No, no. Well, he he kind of grabbed 
granted for himself. So what's Jesus? When he became when he can a man, granted for himself. Wait, let me ask you. You know, when you when you pray for something, you normally pray for something you don't have. For example, if there is a mother, uh, sorry, let's say there's a woman and she doesn't have a child, so she prays for a child. My God, grant me a child. But if she already has a child. Yes, unless she wants a second one. The question is, why is she praying for something that she already has? And she's, she's okay with that. The reason Jesus lost, you know, have you read, um, you, you'll, you'll accuse me of going to another passage. But in order to bring things into perspective, we have to go to different, different passages. Others will have Christians blaming, oh, you're only sticking to one passage, you're ignoring the rest of the Bible. In fact, I'm putting things into perspective. Because if you look in Philippians, he says he lost, sorry, he has... Uh, what is the word you use in Philippians? Yes, he became nothing. Yes? And he gave up. He gave up his, uh, basically everything that he had, which, he, which includes the divinity. And that's the reason Jesus, and Jesus is praying for the glory. And this man is saying, you already have the glory. But then the question arises, why is he praying for glory? It doesn't make sense. It only makes sense if he lost it. It doesn't okay, make let's, sense. Let's go to Philippians, as you quoted it. it. talks about Jesus, who being in very nature God. So straight away, it states like John did in John 1, verse 1, the divinity of Jesus. Did not consider equality with God, equality, not lesser, equality yeah. with God, something to be used for his own advantage. Mm -hmm. Rather, he made himself nothing, meaning of no reputation, by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So that one little passage you quoted refutes everything uh, that actually you don't believe. No, the divinity don't. of Jesus, the incarnation of it Jesus, doesn't. the death of Jesus, and he goes on to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so so you're saying he became nothing. What does that mean? It means of no reputation. He he became part of, the same as you and me, part of his creation. Thank you, so not God. <laughs> when you become a man, that means you're no longer God. No, so no, he's no. actually agreeing with me by using the Philippians chapter, which I used against him. In fact, he's agreeing that he became nothing, means not divine anymore. Wait, no. All right, no, wait, wait, let me finish. And you say when it starts Philippians with, uh, what is it? Who being in the very nature God, you know, Adam was created in the nature of God. Yes, he's in the image of God. That is what it means, nature, forme in Greek, which you should know. In this, it's saying you're in the form or image of God, just like Adam was created in Genesis. It says he's in the image of God, Genesis 1 to, 1 to uh, chapter 1, to, uh, verse 27. When he says in the image of God, that's what it means because he's showing, again in Philippians, is showing that he became a man, yes, who is of no reputation, all right, means he's no longer God because God has reputation, God has glory. And that is exactly what he's telling me that he lost his reputation and no longer as glorious as he's supposed to be. Sure, sure, now, sure, wait, wait. Me in Genesis where Adam ever thought he was equal with God. I didn't say equal to God. That's what fact, says, No, he's saying no. He equal with God. No, he says equal no with equality God. with God. Equal with God. <laughs> no equality with God. Look at it. Look how the twist, the passage of the of Philippians. Read it, read it, read it. You just read it. It's on camera, my friend. I don't need to read it. Who being in very nature God, he made himself did not consider equality with God exactly. something to be used or held exactly. on to. So he's saying there quite clearly that he's equal. No, he's God. not. Yes, he's saying he does not consider equality, <laughs> which is the opposite of equality. Show me, show me any, any, any scholar outside of Islam Don't who would say that. Why are you going to scholars what's in the Bible? Well, because you're reading through it? Muslim eyes, not through common sense or... I'm using to humanize you, whether you, call, whether you want me to, uh, you want to call me a Muslim or not. So when did and and wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. God. He humbled himself and being found in appearance as a man, yes, again, proving my point and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross what does obedient to death mean he was willing to die oh no. yes it does no yes it does he was a, a he he subjected himself to a human body and he subjected him to death you on see, the he doesn't cross. even know the meaning That's what he said. he's he's actually he doesn't have the holy spirit i can tell you at this point oh. when he says so he became the, obedient to death you are. means this man now became subject to death, which we all are as mortal. In other words, earlier he said he became a man. Yes, now he's saying he's able to die. He is 
mortal, unlike the father who never dies, Jesus died by his own creation. Again, proving to us that he is not almighty God. No, because you can kill the body, but you cannot kill the soul. The soul and the spirit live on. All you can do is destroy the body. Jesus himself said that. Don't fear anyone who can destroy uh, the body. Fear him who can render useless so who the soul died on the cross for you? Jesus died on the cross. You just read it there. In no, 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 you 2. said the body died. Okay? The body died. So the question I'm asking you is that you believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who according to you is God, from the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who died for you? The Son of God gave his life on a cross. The Bible says he himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross. Okay, so the second person of the Trinity, the Son or Jesus. The Son of God who took on a human form and took upon the earthly fine. name Jesus. That's fine. So you, which means Savior. Rest so God. now you have agreed that Jesus, the Son of God, or the second person of the Trinity, is not immortal. No, no, because uh, all they did was kill the body. You, they couldn't destroy his spirit. No, but the body, the body is not part of the Trinity, is it? He took upon himself a body. Is the body part of the Trinity? No, I, no one claims it is part of the That's Trinity. Right, so no Christian in history has ever claimed it to be part so of the So good, so once again, so making up an argument. So once again, no we, now we have established that the body died and the body is not part of the Father, Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit or the Trinity. So who died for you from the three? The body... Which is, was not part of the Trinity. Can I finish? Yeah, can you interrupt me every go time? On, go on, go on. Every time. When Jesus became human, yeah. he took upon himself a physical human body. Okay? As a man, he lived on planet Earth for 33 years. That body was nailed to a cross. That body died, but same as when you die, your body will go into the ground, but your spirit and soul will live on. Okay. So with Jesus, when he died upon the cross, the physical body died, but he didn't die. So God he didn't. So you're agreeing, you're agreeing with him, but the body is not part of the Trinity. No, I'm not saying And the that. body God, died. The body was part of Jesus. But not part of the Trinity, human. right? So no one from the Trinity died. No, 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 because because you don't understand the Trinity. I do. Not That's what I'm telling you. you no one from them died. You According to you, the body. Body, in fact, you agreed with me that the body is not part of the Trinity. Once again, can we confirm that? Is the body part what, of What the, do you mean by the Trinity? The Trinity means the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are okay. one being. Okay. Before Jesus came into the world, that is the Trinity as we know it. One, uh, one in essence, three in persons. The Son entered into his own creation and took upon himself a body, the Bible says. Up until that point, he never had a body. Okay. He took upon himself a body. Good. And for 33 years, in that body, he walked here on planet Earth. And it was that body, and, and the body and the spirit and the soul, just like yours, were united. They're not separate, was nailed to the cross. So the body endured the physical pain and the physical suffering. Which is not but, part of the Can I finish? Right. Let also finish. the spiritual suffering, because he himself, the Bible says, bore our sins in his body on the cross. Okay, so after incarnation, he acquired this created form called the body. Yeah? Yeah. So this is a created form, it's a creation of God. It's not God himself. So can we, the, the, the God is not God, right? The God is a creation of God. Shall we agree with that or disagree? I don't understand what you mean by that. Which part of that do you not understand? The body is a creation or not? I, what I'm saying is Jesus became fully human. Mm. The Son entered his world and was fully human, born after a nine month pregnancy. Is the body grew up creation you and I? Is the body creation or not? And over the flesh. Is the flesh of Jesus creation or not? It, yeah, it was created, the body was. Thank you very much. So it is a creation of God. So the body Everybody is a creation of God. Good. Everybody is a creation of God. You're, you're right, except God himself. So if the body is a creation of God, then it is a creation of God which died not no. not no. The, not any part of the Trinity. Am I right? No, because you cannot have a body exist on its own. Your body doesn't exist on its own. It can only exist if it is connected to your spirit and your soul. Um, and, and the body of Jesus cannot exist independent of his spirit and soul. That is why when he died, it was a full sacrifice, not just a, oh, here's the body. I can get another one tomorrow. You can't do that with the body. Good. The body has to be part of the person. 
Very good. So the body is not another person. The body is a part of the person. Well, it, it's what makes somebody a living soul. Thank you. Human you know, that is exactly the point I was trying to make here. But I just wanted you to come from you okay. rather than me. So now when you say the body died and not Jesus, you're basically... No, no, no. Can I finish? Jesus Can I finish? Died, his body was the physical... Can I finish, died. please? Okay. We know what happens during death. So death to me, correct me if I'm wrong, death means a separation of the soul from the body. Do you agree with that? Definition of death? Carry on. No, I want to know because I, I, I need to, I, I, I want, in order to right, proceed. I want to think about it. I don't want to just talk. How, how long do you need like, well, to think I'm about death? a simple man. I might need a few minutes. Carry on. You no, carry on talking. No, no problem. Okay, because for us to go forward, I need to actually, for you to understand this point. Well, if you give me the next statement, I might be in the, to understand. I'm not trying to statement. trick you. That's no, what you're... <laughs> <laughs> he thinks I'm trying to trick him. So insecure, honestly. All right. So death means separation of the soul from the body. Regardless of whether I knew about the Trinity or not, I would still stick with that definition. So whether... The, you see, the body is not another person. Like he correctly said, in order for the body to even operate, it needs to be connected to a person. So the body, the person upon him is the body. All right, not the other word. The person is what? The soul. The definition or the identity of a person is his soul. So if you have a human soul, that is your identity. So even in afterlife, you're going to have that identity even though your body is now disintegrated in the grave. See what I mean? So the question is this. Who died for you? Because all the Christians, you know, I ask this question and they say the body died. The <laughs> they say the body died. The body is not a person. The body is something which is a covering on, on the actual person. Let, let's, let's all right? So now once again, the question from the Father, from the Son, from the Holy Spirit, which person, I'm emphasizing on the term person, died for you? Because if you're going to say body, the body is not a person. The body is not part of the Trinity because the body of Jesus was in the grave or wherever it was, yes? The question is this, which person from the Trinity died for you? Right. The Bible makes it very clear. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Okay, so the Son was born into the world in the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was fully human. He was fully divine. On the cross, people took hold of him and they nailed him to, to the cross. And the Bible says he himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross. Okay. So who died from so the tree? death is both physical and spiritual. Physical death is when the body stop breathing and dies. Spiritual death is a separation from God. Okay, so when Adam sinned in the garden, for example, he was told that the day that he disobeyed God, he would die. He didn't fall down flat and dead, but he was separated from God. He didn't have the intimacy he knew before, so he was cut off once and for all. And when Jesus died upon the cross, he experienced death in all its fullness. That's why he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He was separated because he was bearing the sin of the world. Okay, so which and person so he, he physically died, died for you? Which person from the three died for you? I told you, the Son of God. He okay. loved me, gave Good. himself for So me. Now, now you have admitted the Son of God, which I believe is the second person of the Trinity, died for you. Good, now we have got away from the flesh died for you, or the body died for you. We have now established that one person from the Trinity died for you. So I'm saying that this one person, post-incarnation, became mortal, which means he changed his nature from immortal to mortal because a person dies remember this you know when somebody dies in your family or your relatives or your friend they don't say oh his body died they say that person John died or, or, or I don't know uh, Damien died or something like that they do not say his body died because everyone knows it is a person who dies. So once again, the confirmation, which I didn't get from you, does that means separation of the soul from the body. And if that is the case, then did Jesus experience this? And if Jesus did experience it, that means he is not a mortal person. But I'm telling you what, I believe the Bible says that when Jesus Christ died upon the cross, he bore our sins in his own body on the cross. They killed the body, but you cannot kill the spirit and the soul that lives on. They killed the body. Who died on the cross is a person. Jesus. Thank you. So that is a person. You cannot say the body, the body is not another person, which you clearly demonstrated earlier. The body 
needs a person for it to, to operate. To be alive, to be alive. But of when course. you're dead, the spirit and the soul don't need the body because you're dead. Okay, define death. Death is when the, the spirit and the soul leaves the body. Thank you. Did that happen to Jesus? On the cross, yes. When Good, Jesus so he died. died. He physically died. Yes. Thank you. That means he's, he's not immortal. As a human being, he gave his life on the cross. I didn't ask you why. I didn't ask you why. But I didn't ask you why he sacrificed. All I want to know from you is whether that person, the second person of the Trinity, do you admit that he is not immortal? What I'm saying is, when he died upon the cross, he gave his physical body, which is death. Which, which is what died. Thank you. Which is which means he's mortal. Not immortal. But the spirit and the soul live on. They are not they are not mortal. We are eternal beings. When you die and your spirit and soul leave your body, your body is mortal. That's why it's put in the grave or burnt. But you live on in a different form. I'm talking about immortality and mortality. Are you immortal? I will yeah, my my spirit and soul. I didn't ask about your spirit. Can are I, you can immortal? I finish? Can I finish? Yeah, you can, but you need to answer the question. Are well, you as you are you as a person me? immortal? You've interrupting me. Let me say, Go on. every human being is made up of a physical body, which is mortal, with an eternal spirit. And when you die, that spirit will either go to heaven or hell, depending on what you do with Jesus Christ. Are you immortal? I've just told you, yes. No. My body is not mortal, but my spirit okay. and my soul is. Let me remind you of the passage in the Bible. First Timothy, chapter 6, verse number 16. It says, he alone is immortal. Yes, who lives in unapproachable light. Yeah, that's good. Can you let me finish? Okay. Thank you. He alone is immortal, alone, emphasis on the term alone, and the term immortal. So God is saying, he alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. Whom is this passage talking about? Okay. Let me give my, so my answer. Can yeah. I give my answer? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Okay. When I'm talking about am I mortal, I'm saying I when when I I had a, a start nine months before I entered planet Earth, same as you did, at conception. From that point on, I was born with a physical body that is mortal and an immortal spirit. But God never had a birth, he never had a start. That's why he's the only immortal being, because no he was never born and he can never die. So in that sense, God is different to us. So it's a play on words. When I say, yes, I'm immortal in the sense that I believe every human being, they had a start, unlike God. Uh, the body will die, but their spirit will live on, whereas God has always been. That's why he's the only true God, I, I think, the immortal God. I think you mixed up the term eternal and immortal. Yes. Maybe, maybe I did. Yes, maybe so did. once again, the question, in the context of this passage, what does the term immortal mean? Well, in the context of that passage off the top of my head, I don't know. I'm just telling you the difference between God Why not? And I read the passage to you. Tell me what does immortal mean? He alone is immortal, who lives in an approachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. We know that the term immortal is not the same as the term eternal okay so in English the term immortal the dictionary definition of that is what I'll come back next week and tell you when I've looked it up you're an English man you should know this no I'll come back next week when I've looked it up you've already looked it up that's why you're throwing so it why don't you ask me can, what it means can, can, I, can you can I finish yeah go on you've already looked it up you've yes. got your proof text you're throwing them out because you've researched them I'm speaking off the cuff off the top of my head I will go away and look at it and come back and talk to you about that word immortal and that verse in Timothy next week you know earlier you defined it well, according to you, I'm It's on the camera. I'm glad I've got such wisdom. I didn't know it was that clever. No, you are actually. Thank you, you. You don't give credit enough to yourself. Thank you. All right. So once again, based on what you said earlier, what does immortal mean in the context of this passage? Which passage? 1 Timothy or, or Philippians? First Timothy. I don't know in the context of 1 Timothy until I go away and look at it. Okay. I can tell you can, off the top of my head what I think. Right. It's can, can the term differ? Can the term immortal differ in different passages? I the meaning. Know. I don't know. Can the meaning of the I term? I don't know if I go away and uh, uh, you, you know, the Bible says a, you know, a, a fool answers uh, with, without any... Well, it's not the Bible, but... Come <laughs> it's not the Bible. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Look, my friend, I'm actually taking, taking the Bible Taking the passage of the Bible, you are, you now now you're struggling with the English term immortal. No, you know, as a, as a Christian who knows his Bible, you should 
clearly say that here God is saying he alone is immortal, means he's the only one who is not subject to death, a physical death, which Jesus was subject to, which you are subject to, which I am subject to, and which every mortal person is subject to. According to this passage, who is the only one who is immortal? That is God Almighty. That is the Father according to your Bible. Whether you want to go and research it, that's up to you. But the point will not change. Doesn't matter how many scholars you ask. He alone, the term is alone. That means there's only one who is immortal. What you told me about the, about the soul being immortal, this is after your first death. Everyone experiences the first death. When you are resurrected, then your soul becomes immortal. Whether it's immortal in eternal damnation or eternal bliss, that is up to God Almighty to judge. But the point is this, that everyone dies, regardless who they are. As it says in the Quran, Kullu nafsin al maut. That means everyone shall taste death. And this is, uh, if you want to come closer to the light maybe. That's okay, I'm going yeah. to do it anyway. So what I'm saying is that if God himself is saying that he is the only one who's immortal, then we shouldn't dispute. Jesus died as you correctly pointed out, which means he's not immortal. Hence, Jesus is not co-equal to the Father. The Father never ever dies. Jesus died by his own creation, according to your, according to your belief or, uh, that he died by crucifixion. The point is this. If Jesus is not co-equal to the Father, he cannot be Almighty God. Jesus himself is saying, I'm, I'm praying. He's saying, he himself is praying for glory. And you know, by the way, in John 17, where he confirms that the only true God is the Father, that means there can be only one true God. And according to Jesus, that only true God is just the Father, not himself, not the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is all proof text from your own Bible. And finally, in John 17 again, I believe in, um, in verse number 22, he gives the glory that God gave him, you know to whom? To all his disciples and the believers in God. If Jesus gives the God-given glory to them, will they all now become God according to your understanding? Because the Christians always say, oh, he's got this glory since eternity, all right? But then Jesus gives the same glory to his disciples and the believers. Now you got how many gods? 12 plus this three, that, that very 15. That statement just proves how you cannot read the Bible logically and how you misinterpret it. Okay, how did I misinterpret it? So, Go on. So what you need to do, again with John 17, is read the first 16 chapters before it, and especially chapter one, which lays the foundation and explains everything that and how does it change what I just and said again you're interrupting me when I'm talking because yeah, you're repeating yeah. yourself I'm what again. you said earlier you're just you're repeating yourself okay I won't say anymore because yeah I because you want to go now you're done you're finished I am finished good all right so if you're finished then the, go, you're the one who should go and do some homework now go and tell us read the entire Bible if you have to and then tell me why does Jesus giving the God-given glory to him doesn't make his own disciples and the believers into God as well because if that is the divine glory that Jesus got and then the divine glory was given to the disciples the creation of God then his creation also becomes God by by the logic and the definition of what no, by your divine logic, by Muslim logic well, that, that, you know if you, if you actually read it in context you'd, you'd come to a different conclusion you know if you had read it in context and if you had understood it you would have had an answer by now the reason you don't have an answer the reason you're using this ex, uh, what is excuses to go and read the uh, rest of the 16 uh, chapters actually how do you know I didn't read it? And I came to the conclusion that Jesus is not Almighty God. He's in fact mortal. He got crucified and killed by his own creation. Hence, he is not even powerful. He doesn't have the glory. Hence, he's praying for it. He gives a glory given by God to other people. And if you read, I've, I've done a bit more research, even from the Old Testament. If you read Isaiah 42, I believe uh, verse number eight, it says God does not share his glory with anyone. The fact Jesus shared his glory proves again just from the Old Testament as well, that is not all God, God Almighty. And Jazakallah khairan for that, because I think with that we should okay, finish. And the fact you, you got, you got you some... You can't get past verse one, just proves you can't understand. Well, that's your opinion. I think the okay. people will judge who really had passages and proofs and evidence, which you had no response to other than excuse like, go and read context, 16. Context, context. As soon as you take it out of its context... So you put it in context and gone. Context, you're left with a you put it in context. Here's your chance now. We just we just spoken for an hour, and uh, I so you have no contacts either. Thank you very much. Sorry, I forgot your name. Gordon. Gordon. I speak to you again next Go time. Gordon.
If you had context, you would have mentioned it. The fact I that you don't. Context. John chapter the 1 verse no. is the foundation. John 1.1. 1, 1. If you dismiss that, the rest of it doesn't make sense. Exactly. It falls like dominoes. Makes sense. What we have just seen is John 1.1, 1, 1, which is actually That's about... the foundation you build on and you've got... No, there's no Trinity in John 1.1. 1, 1. So your argument is all on sand. By the way, there's no Holy Spirit in John 1.1. 1, 1. So your Trinity is not complete, even in John 1.1. 1, 1. It's not trying to prove Bye -bye. the Trinity. It's not trying to prove <laughs> the Trinity. What are we doing all this time? No, no, no. John 1 is proving the Trinity. <laughs> God doesn't know what we were trying to, what we were even John discussing. John 1 is proving the Why divinity shouting, of Jesus. Why shouting? You're Calm down. You're shouting. All I'm saying is that John, John 1, 1, 1 proves the divinity of Jesus. No, it, it doesn't. It's not trying to prove the Holy Spirit. It is not trying to prove the Trinity. Context, he takes it a, a text out of its context and he's got a con. Deception. Uh, yeah, John 73 is deception. That's your own Bible, by the way. <laughs> if I'm using your own Bible to deceive you, then you're saying John is deceiving you. Look, the, the passages are clear. Jesus himself, by the way, John 1, 1 is not the words of Jesus. I actually use even stronger argument. I use the words of Jesus Christ himself. That the only true God is the Father. And Jesus Christ is who? Is the one who was sent by this only true God. Christ means the Messiah. That's all he's saying I am. I am the Messiah and I was sent by the only true God who is the Father. The Father is according to them God Almighty because in John 20, 17, he addresses the Father as my God and my Father in John 20, 17. Again, that only proves the point that the Muslims have been saying all along that Jesus is but a servant of God. Yes, he is the Messiah of God and he is not God Almighty. And as one of the passages which he quoted, not me, is Jesus on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Can you believe this? God Almighty calling another God. He said he's fully God, remember? Jesus is fully God. So this fully God is telling another fully God that you abandoned me. So now we got two gods. That is polytheism. And that's clearly against what Abraham preached, against what Moses preached, and against what Jesus Christ preached, and against what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the last and the final messenger preached. And they were all in union that God Almighty is one unique. He doesn't have a son. None of them said he has a son. Okay, like the way the Christians believe. All right. When they talk about sons of God in the Old Testament, it's talking about the servants of God, all right? Because Adam is called the son of God. Yes, David is called the son of God. Solomon is called the sons of God. They are sons by the tons. As Sheikh Didad used to say, Rahim Allah. All we are saying is that when you talk about God Almighty, do not associate partners with him. Because that is shirk, one of the biggest sin, the sin which will not be forgiven by Allah if you die upon it. The only sin which, will, which is unforgivable is this shirk. So them associating, in fact, this is, you know, this is not only about the Muslims, but even the Jews, they don't believe that God is someone who's created, who's a creation of God, like Jesus who became a man. They don't believe this. So the Christians are the old ones out from the Abrahamic faith. Yes? What's wrong with this? And this is clearly against what Jesus himself preached, that the only God, the only true God is the Father, and Jesus Christ is but his Messiah, his servant. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, no, 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 no,